Uh, the next talk is from Ricardo Dolmich, and th the title of his talk is Using Human Genetics and Stem Cells to Study Brain Development. Uh, Ricardo was until recently at Stanford University, and he was recently lured over by the Allen Institute to join them in taking on um, a, a new large-scale project to start looking to look at human ES cells, human iPS cells, stem cell systems as a way of exploring the genetic networks that are involved in both brain development and what goes wrong in the brain during various disease states. And he's going to talk to us about that work today. Great. Well, thank you very much. Um, so today I'm going to tell you uh, a little bit about the work we uh, are planning to do and a little bit about the work we've done, trying to uh, take advantage of the confluence of stem cell biology and human genetics to understand development, but also to understand human disease. Uh, this is part of a new project uh, at where uh, that we call the Molecular Networks Project. And uh, essentially, we're trying to answer two major questions. Right? The first question, of course, is how the brain is built. This is a very large question that many, many people work on. And we think that there might be a different way of doing this that takes advantage of some of the strengths and the resources that we've developed at the Allen Institute. And then the second question is, how does this go wrong in various neurodevelopmental and neuropsychiatric diseases? Um, so if you think about the problem that a uh, developing cell uh, faces, uh, it's, uh, it, it, it faces the problem of uh, essentially building a very, very complex structure using essentially a set of a sort of asymmetrical cell divisions and specializations. And uh, all of this is controlled by a very, very complex network of proteins and small molecules and genetic elements and RNAs. And uh, the question is, how do we understand a network like this? And so there are a couple of approaches you could think of. I mean, one approach you could think of is you could try to collect all the data. You could collect genetic data, and you collect protein-protein interaction data, and you could collect uh, maybe metabolomic data, and then you could try and make some sense of this. And um, there are a couple of problems with that approach. I mean, one, approach, one problem is that you can collect a huge amount of data, and it can be very difficult to make sense of it. Uh, and the, the second problem is that it's sort of an inefficient way of doing things. If you sort of know uh, to a, sort of what the outcome ought to be, uh, what you'd like to do is you'd like to focus on the parts of the network that are really important for the set of events that you're, uh, that you're, that you're interested in, right? And so the question is, how do you prioritize this? And so uh, the project that I'm going to tell you about today takes advantage of um, another model organism, uh, the, the human. Uh, and uh, it, it takes advantage of the fact that there are, you know, six billion humans, and essentially the genetics experiment has been done. Uh, we all are different. We are all different, at least partly, because we have very different genomes. In addition to this, there are a large number of mutations that change our development and our behavior. And this, we think, will allow us to prioritize which parts of this network to characterize. So our goals are, first of all, to identify the molecular networks that control neural development and function. This, of course, is a very large goal, and we would be very happy if we could do just a little piece of this. Uh, we want to understand the cellular and molecular basis of neurodevelopmental disease because, in fact, many neuropsychiatric and neurodevelopmental diseases are genetically based, and by and large, we don't understand them. And then finally, uh, and this is an important part of the effort, we want to generate public resources that will essentially act as a force multiplier, that will allow the field to take advantage of these technologies to uh, study these questions. Um, so uh, just let me just you know, uh, tell you a little bit about why we think that using genetics to prioritize data collection makes sense. So uh, this is just a little uh, cartoon of, it's actually a little bit old now, of the number of mutations that are, are thought to be, or the number of genomic regions that are thought to be associated with autism, and there are a large number of them. Um, and uh, this illustrates this, this, uh, this fact that, you know, the human genetic population contains a very large set of uh, genetic variants. And one of the things is that we can phenotype and genotype humans much better than other species. We, we have a whole medical system dedicated just to this. And uh, so this gives us access to a very, very broad diversity of behaviors and functions. 
as well as pretty deep phenotyping for many, many people. Uh, the second uh, part of this is that uh, we can, let's change this here, uh, is that by, by taking advantage of some of these mutations, we can identify these molecular pathways and hubs that are functionally important. And then finally, uh, we can use uh, these human cells uh, to study genetic interactions that change the, that, that change the uh, final outcome of the process. Uh, and this, in turn, allows us to study these rare genetic diseases, which are an important unmet medical need. And so, you know, the, the very basic sort of model for how uh, genes interact to ultimately regulate the development of the brain is sort of illustrated here. We all have a genetic background with these single nucleotide polymorphisms that are either uh, protective uh, against certain behaviors or predisposes to certain behaviors, and then superimposed on these, there are essentially two classes of changes. There are these copy number variants uh, that uh, are essentially microduplications or microdeletions, uh, or there are these rare mutations. And together, this tips the balance, leading to a particular class of behavior. And the, the fantastic thing is that over the next, the last, uh, you know two years and over the next maybe two or three years, we will identify many, many of these copy number variants and many of these rare mutations. And so the question then becomes, what do these do and how do they integrate with the genetic background? Um, okay, so what makes this project possible is what has really been a revolution in stem cell biology. Um, and, you know, so as I said, we're starting with the human genetic population over here and its, it's uh, wealth of, of genetic variability. But uh, to study humans, we need to somehow be able to recreate little pieces of their brain, little pieces of their developing brain. And you know, for a long time, this wasn't possible. I mean, one of the reasons why we've moved so much faster in oncology, say, than we ever, than we ever have in uh, neuroscience in terms of disease is simply because we had access to uh, tissues that were diseased. So we had access to tumor biopsies. We didn't have access to brain biopsies from people with disorders. And as a consequence, it was very difficult to make sense of the mutations that led to disease, right? And so um, what, what has changed is that now we have this capacity to make a biopsy in the lab. And uh, the way we do this is we can take somatic cells, something like a skin cell or a blood cell, and reprogram it to generate a pluripotent stem cell and then take that stem cell and differentiate it into a particular class of neurons and then use uh, omics sort of uh, high coverage technologies to interrogate that cell. And then finally, we can take uh, this data and uh, use it to generate various classes of models. And so this is essentially the approach. Sort of a, a simpler version of this is illustrated here. So what we're proposing to do is to harvest, harvest skin cells from patients with specific neurodevelopmental disorders. We program the skin cells to generate these pluripotent stem cells, convert the stem cells into neurons, and then phenotype the neurons. And uh, in parallel to this, we are also going to take advantage of another technology that allows us to uh, essentially generate specific classes of mutations in the uniform genetic background using uh, a set of enzymes called talins. Uh, or a set of DNA binding proteins called talons. Um, okay, so what do we have so far for our project? So uh, we have been uh, making these induced pluripotent stem cells uh, for some time. And so for now, we have about 50 patients, about 150 lines from a whole series of disorders that we think are very likely to affect development. And this is part of a collaboration with Stanford and NIMH, but we're always looking for new collaborators uh, to uh, essentially recruit more and better characterized sets of patients. Now, in addition to this, we're making these induced mutations using these talons. Now, for those of you who don't know what talons are, it turns out that one of the big problems in studying development using embryonic stem cells is the fact that uh, homologous recombination doesn't happen very easily in human stem cells. And so, um, unlike in the mouse, where you can just simply put a homologous piece of DNA and at some frequency there's recombination, in human cells this just doesn't work. So one approach that you can use is you can generate a, uh, an enzyme that will specifically bind to a specific piece of DNA. And the approach here is to use a family of proteins that were originally identified in, uh, in bacteria, these bacteria that infect uh, plants. And it turns out that they're modular so that you can put together these sets of repeats in such a way that it'll bind a specific sequence of DNA. And then you can add a cargo to this 
you know, in such a way that you can then cause a double-stranded break. And upon double the, and once there's a double-stranded break, then you can uh, essentially take advantage of uh, double break, double-stranded break repair to introduce a sequence variant. Um, so, uh, so we've generated quite a lot of iPS cells. Uh, we uh, actually don't see ourselves as sort of being in the business of generating large collections. We've generated the initial collection mostly because there weren't collections out there, but now there, is, there are many efforts to generate uh, iPS cells from interesting populations of patients, and we hope to plug into some of those. But the basic approach is illustrated here. We take uh, fibroblasts or blood cells. We can introduce these reprogramming factors that essentially change the folding of the uh, DNA. And if you do this under the right conditions, you get cells that look like this. These cells are uh, called induced pluripotent stem cells, but they look for all the world like human embryonic stem cells. And uh, then you have, if you do this right, and you're doing it on a large scale, you have these quality control steps where, for example, you stain for reprogramming factors, you karyotype the cells in various ways, uh, or, and you do expression microarrays to make sure that the cells that you have really look like pluripotent stem cells. Um, now, the other approach is to generate tail ends that allow you to uh, essentially recapitulate a specific mutation in a neutral genetic background. And um, so I told you a little bit about the enzyme itself, which is essentially a DNA binding domain linked to the FOK1 nuclease, right? But in addition to this, you need these donor vectors, which then get integrated into a specific gene. And so one of the things that we're uh, developing as a public resource is not only a set of tail ends for developmentally important and disease-related genes, but also a set of donor vectors that allow us to uh, manipulate those genes. So for example, we have donor vectors that introduce a stop codon, uh, other don and a fluorescent protein, so you can both knock out the gene and also eliminate uh, and also mark its expression in, in human embryonic stem cells. Uh, we have other versions, for example, where you can introduce a degron so that now you have a fluorescently labeled protein that can be degraded when you add a specific drug and so forth, right? And uh, we've developed a pipeline for doing this. Uh, that we hope will allow us to not only make a large collection of these tail ends and make them available to the community, but also, uh, you know, introduce them into lines and make the lines available to the community. Um, okay, so, so the next step in the process is to convert the stem cells into neurons. And so, you know, one of the key questions is how good are we at doing this and uh, which sets of neurons are we going to make? And, um, uh, so there are multiple phases to the project. I'm going to tell you about phases one and two for which we have, you know, some thoughts. Uh, so for phase one, uh, we are going to focus on making these cortical projection neurons. This is largely because this is a protocol that is now quite well established, not only in my lab, but also in other labs uh, in the field. And uh, the basic way in which this works is you start with these induced pluripotent stem cells, you generate these embryoid bodies, from these embryoid bodies, you can then generate these circular structures called rosettes, which look uh, essentially like the cross-section of the developing human neural tube. And you know this because you can, it's hard to see here, but you can stain them with markers for uh, various uh, neural tube structures, and they have this beautiful, uh, these beautiful staining patterns. And we also know from gene expression that they look very much like the developing human neural tube. You can take these, you can expand them as these neurospheres that have this interesting internal structure. They have a sort of lumen in the center and then layers on the outside. They have neurons that are developing from the very center and are migrating out. And then you can take these and essentially use them to generate various classes of neurons and glial cells. We've also been working on a uh, protocol for developing interneurons along with other people in the field, John Rubenstein and others. And so uh, we, are now, uh, we can now make these inhibitory interneurons that are actually born in a different part of the brain. Um, so uh, one of the things we've done is we spent a lot of time characterizing these uh, projection neurons. I'm just going to take you through a little bit of the data. Um, so this is what the projection neurons sort of look like. Uh, they look for all the world like a uh, culture of neurons that you might uh, make from a piece of human cortex or a piece of mouse or rat cortex. Um, and uh, we spent a lot of time trying to figure out which classes of cells we actually have in the dish. And so the technology to do this uh, has uh, actually only recently emerged. So you can imagine that one approach to doing this would just simply be to use antibody staining and see whether you know, the cells, based on antibodies, whether the cells sort of look like they're supposed to look based on the expression of certain proteins. And the main problem with that approach is simply that the antibodies that we have are not very good, and they don't recognize humans protein, human proteins very well. 
And in addition to this, for any single cell, you can generally only uh, a, you, you can you can only stain with one or a few antibodies. So uh, we've taken a different approach, and the idea is to take these cells and dissociate them into single cells, uh, sort them with a fluorescence-activated cell sorter, so that we essentially get a single cell suspension that then uh, get put into these 96 wall plates, and then from every cell we measure the expression of between 200 and 300 genes. And so for every cell, you essentially get this barcode uh, of which genes that cell expresses at a particular time in development. And if you do this thousands of times, you get a distribution of the fraction of cells that are expressing particular classes, particular marker genes. So for example, this is at around day 60, right? So at around day 60, half of the cells are still progenitors, half of them are now neurons. Right? Of the progenitors, the vast majority are actually dorsal progenitors, so they're the ones that are at the very top of your brain that are going to form your cortex. Right? Um, and then if you look at the neurons, there are about half of them are excitatory and half of them are inhibitory. Uh, in addition to this, they express a variety of receptors, dopamine receptors and other kinds of receptors, and then they have uh, all these markers for specific cell layers. And you can take advantage of the fact that uh, we have all this great data from the atlas to try and see which classes of cells we're making. And so there's a combinatorial code for, uh, the, uh, for various classes of neurons in different layers. So we can make both upper and lower layer cortical neurons. And uh, you know, at this particular time in development, there are more lower layer cells than upper layer cells. And this is, in fact, reflecting that this is the, this reflects the fact that this is the order in which neurons are actually generated. Right, so you make lower layer cells first and upper layer cells a second. In addition to this, we can determine which ones actually would form the corpus callosum versus which ones would project downward into the brain, again, based on combinations of transcription factor uh, expression. Um, so you might want to know if these cells are functional. And so one approach to doing this is to load them with a calcium indicator and stimulate them electrically. And so if you do this, you get cells that look sort of like this. Uh, we've stimulated them all synchronously, but you can see that they fire lots of action potentials. This is what you would want neurons to do. Um, now, of course, the gold standard for this uh, is not uh, calcium imaging, but uh, electrophysiology. And uh, so we've patch clamped many, many of these cells. Uh, and uh, so in order to patch clamp specific classes of neurons, we've also developed these cell type specific reporter genes. And we would also like to make a collection of these available to the community. In this case, this is a, a reporter gene that is very specific for, a, uh, for pyramidal projection neurons. And so uh, we can patch clamp these cells. They fire beautiful action potentials. They form beautiful synapses. We can see synaptic events. Uh, it turns out that at around day 60, only about a quarter of the cells actually fire these mature action potentials, you know, and about another quarter fire just one, and a whole bunch of them don't fire anything, presumably because they're still precursors. Now, the other thing that we can do is when we patch clamp a cell, we can then measure the expression of these reporter genes using the, uh, this, this uh, massively multiplex PCR technology, thus allowing us to uh, sort of after the fact determine which classes of cells we recorded from. Um, Okay, so the final question is, can we identify phenotypes that are associated with specific classes of mutations, uh, some of which, of course, might be associated with disease? And um, to do this, uh, we, again, have developed a pipeline. And so uh, what, we'd like to do this, what we'd like to do is we'd like to do this on a relatively large scale. Uh, and this is sort of what it looks like. So we start out with these cell lines. We're going to differentiate them uh, initially into one class and then subsequently perhaps into two classes of neurons. Uh, we're sequencing the genomes, or we're actually collaborating with uh, groups that have already sequenced genomes. Uh, we are then going to essentially do two classes of characterization. So we will functionally phenotype the cells using this, the calcium imaging uh, technology that I just showed you. Uh, we're going to look at the morphology. We, we, we can look at synapse formation using automated microscopy. And again, these are tools that were originally developed for drug screening, but that can be very useful for this kind of approach. And then in addition to this, we can do electrophysiology on some subset of the cells. Now, in parallel, we're going to uh, take uh, advantage of new developments in uh, our capacity to look at things on a genome-wide scale. And so we are initially uh, doing RNA-seq to look at the expression of specific genes. We're going to do chip seq to look at which pieces of chromatin are open or closed. Uh, we are using fluorescence-activated cell sorting to look at the 
at the expression of specific uh, critical marker genes. Uh, we're using this massively multiplex uh, PCR technology, the fluidon technology. And then finally, uh, for a subset of proteins, we will actually look at uh, the proteins, the, the sort of proteome, you know, which sets of proteins interact with the protein that was mutated. Um, so, so this is sort of the dream collection, right? Now, um, you can imagine that there are two classes of experiments you might want to do, right? So one thing you might want to do is you might want to essentially take this battery of characterization and use it to phenotype a large population of diverse individuals with some sort of common disorder, a bunch of people with autism. I care a lot about autism, and so I've been thinking a lot about what you'd like, what, what you could uh, use this technology for. And so, but if you were going to do that, it would be very difficult to do all of these things, and so uh, especially if you're going to do it for hundreds of thousands of people, so we have a pared-down version of this that essentially allows us to uh, get a much leaner characterization, but to do it for many more people. Now, the other kind of experiment would be to really focus on one specific class of mutation, and we're interested in doing that as well. Uh, and to do that, then, we will collect this very broad array of data. Um, OK, so now I'm going to just finish by telling you about two specific classes of, uh, of, of defects associated with specific mutations. And I'm going to start with something we've worked on for a long time, which is uh, a mutation in a gene that encodes a voltage-gated calcium channel, uh, the L-type calcium channel. And this causes a disease called Timothy syndrome. And these kids have uh, autism, and they have a cardiac arrhythmia, and they have this cutaneous syndactyly. And uh, this is associated with this mutation in this channel protein. So this is a voltage-gated calcium channel that lets calcium into cells in response to a change in membrane potential. There's a point mutation here, and this changes the kinetics of the channel so that instead of the channel opening and closing, uh, it opens and stays open. Now, it turns out that this occurs only in one chromosome and only in one of the splice variants of the channel, so it's not clear how it is that this changes the development and function of the brain. Um, so uh, one of the things we've looked at uh, is we've looked at the ability of, so, so this channel is known to be important for regulating activity-dependent uh, dendritic arborization in neurons. And so we've developed an assay that allows us to look at activity-dependent dendritic growth by introducing channel rhodopsin into the cells, stimulating the cells with light. Every time you illuminate the cells, they fire action potentials, and then you can image the morphology over long periods of time, and you get movies that look kind of like this. Uh, and then you can use automated tracking to actually look at every extension and retraction event in every one of these dendrites. And if you do this for lots of cells, you get something like this. So control cells essentially extend their dendrites uh, as you stimulate them, but the Timothy cells actually start retracting their dendrites. Now, I should say that we've looked at lots of things, and there, there are many uh, ways in which the Timothy neurons are actually normal, but it turns out that they the, this mutation, for some reason, is converting this channel into being a promoter of dendritic growth to being an inhibitor of dendritic growth. And we know now a little bit about the mechanism by which this happens, but I won't, won't go into that. I just want to illustrate uh, why we think that uh, it's possible to find phenotypes associated with mutations. Now, one of the things you can do then, once you know that there's this defect in dendritic arborization, is you can use a chemical library to look at uh, signaling pathways that might be related, as well as perhaps to provide some early hits for, uh, you know, for maybe therapeutic development. Again, this is a very small population of patients. It's very unlikely that, for example, a drug company would go after them. But if you, for example, screen uh, all the compounds that have ever been used in man, then you might be able to repurpose something that's out there. And in fact, this is what we did. We screened this low-pack library, which uh, has the majority of compounds that have been tried in humans. And so these are control cells. These are the Timothy cells. And we're looking at the changes in dendritic length. And we've done this for thousands of compounds, but I'm only going to show you a few of them. It turns out that out of uh, you know, 1,200, we basically got three hits. Most things don't do anything to the dendritic arbor. Uh, and these are quite interesting. This one, for example, is this compound called Roscovitin, which is a CDK1 inhibitor. It may also be an atypical L-type channel uh, blocker that reverses this inactivation defect. Uh, there are some kinase inhibitors. Uh, there is a hormone. And so this gives us some clues about the pathways that might be downstream, as well as some possible therapeutic alternatives for these rare patients. Um, OK, so the other thing you can do is you can look at gene expression, 
uh, in these cells. And in this case, we're looking at the genes that are either upregulated or downregulated in response to electrical activity in Timothy cells uh, differentially from controls. So if you look at the upregulated genes, there are a lot of genes that you might recognize. These are known calcium-regulated genes. This might be what you expect. But then there are a lot of other genes that are not exactly what you would expect. And so we were quite interested in the fact that there was a module that seemed to be important for catecholamine synthesis. So catecholamines, uh, dopamine and norepinephrine, are you know, important in autism and in other psychiatric disorders. Uh, and uh, in fact, based on this data, we came up with a kind of epistatic model of uh, sort of signaling molecules that are altered in Timothy patients. Everything in green uh, was actually altered in the Timothy patients. And the gray things are hubs in this pathway. We focused initially uh, on this tyrosine hydroxylase uh, catecholamine uh, hub. And we looked to see whether there were changes in the fraction of cells that produce catecholamines by staining for tyrosine hydroxylase. Again, these are control cells. These are the Timothy cells. The green cells are the ones that express tyrosine hydroxylase. You can see that in control cultures, there are you know, just very rare cells that uh, express tyrosine hydroxylase. In the Timothy patients, there are many, many, many. Right? And in fact, uh, this is true not just for one Timothy patient, but for many of them. Uh, not true for another kind of uh, disorder. This is 22Q11 deletion, which is another kind of intellectual disability, psychosis, autism uh, syndrome. Um, and then we can also look at the actual uh, secretion of norepinephrine and dopamine. And again, you can see that there is an increase in the uh, uh, secretion of norepinephrine and a small increase in the production of dopamine. And then we've actually been able to go back to the patients and measure catecholamines in the blood. And in fact, they produce too many catecholamines, which may help to explain why it is that they have tremendous anxiety. And in fact, this has led now to the use of beta blockers uh, to try and treat their anxiety. Um, so uh, just an, another, another example where we can use this stem cell technology to look at uh, possible changes uh, at, at possible cellular phenotypes where we might discover something that we wouldn't have suspected comes from this study. Here we've looked at kids that have something called Phil and McDermott syndrome, which is a deletion of chromosome 22Q13. And, uh, and so this uh, includes a whole bunch of genes, and one of the genes is uh, a gene uh, for a protein in the synapse called Shank3. Um, and uh, what we did is we uh, patch clamped, we generated neurons, we patch clamped the cells, and so actually we co-cultured the patient and control neurons in the same dish, and you could see right away that there were big differences in the synaptic responses and the spontaneous synaptic events in control and patient cells. Uh, this was also true if you got, looked at evoked release, right? So you can see that there's this big response in the controls and a very small response in the patients, both for uh, NMDA and AMPA receptors, and this is illustrated here. So all the red dots are down here, which are the patients, and all the gray ones are up here. This is a stimulus, as, this is a stimulus response sort of graph. Right? Um, and uh, we then looked more specifically, and it turns out that, in fact, there are reduced numbers of AMPA and NMDA receptors in these cells, but that the inhibitory synapses are just fine. So in fact, there are uh, GABA, the GABAergic synapses are, are, are perfectly fine. And then uh, we could then try and see whether there was something we could do to rescue. So there are many, many genes that are deleted in this region. One of the key questions is, is it really the case that Shank3 is important? So we rescued by introducing Shank3 into the cells. And you can see now that you can actually get recovery of some of these synaptic events, as well as recovery of the evoked response. Uh, now, the other thing you can do is you can look to see whether uh, agents that people have suggested might change synaptic function also rescue. And again, here we were able to use IGF-1, which uh, people have suggested is important for synapse formation. And this, again, helps rescues the uh, response. Okay? So let me just, just finish by telling you where I think we are now. So, so this is Gardner's graph of, uh, of sort of the of technology innovation, right? This expectations as a function of time. There's the technology trigger. You can think of this as sort of, you know, uh, the uh, development of iPS cells. Initially, the promise is huge, and the expectations are enormous. This is going to solve everything. This is going to be the way we're going to understand the brain. And then there's the trough of disillusionment as people figure out that there are all kinds of problems. And so, in fact, we've been here for some time now. Uh, and so we, we, you know, so so the question is, what kinds of things can we do with this technology? And I think. The, there are some kinds of questions that you can answer and others, of course, that you can't. So there are questions about cell biology and cell intrinsic 
behaviors that are addressable, and there are questions about circuits that are going to be very difficult to address. Right? And so we hope to be sort of moving slowly up the slope of enlightenment towards the plateau of productivity. And uh, we hope to be able to do this by generating these uh, public resources that will allow many, many people to use these cells uh, and uh, as well as uh, developing data that will uh, allow us to uh, understand how it is that these mutations affect uh, function. So just finally, you know, what do we hope to do at the end? So we hope to generate public resources, which are basically patient-derived uh, iPS cells and neuronal progenitors, some tail-ins, some donor constructs, and some tail-in generated lines, and then some shallow and deep cellular phenotyping data, all of which will be publicly available. And then in terms of science, we hope that this will lead to the identification of molecules and mechanisms that control neural development. We hope that we'll be able to generate at least some models of diseases in a dish that will be used by others to maybe develop therapeutics. And then finally, we hope that this will allow us to uh, stratify uh, idiopathic diseases along uh, a different axis than has been done in the past. Uh, and so with that, let me just thank uh, the people who made all this work possible. These are the people in my lab at Stanford. These, this is a subset of the people who are working on this project at the Allen Institute. Uh, and then uh, these are some of the people that made the work possible. I just want to point out uh, uh, Sergio Pashka and Alex Sheglotivov, who are, so were essential in the uh, Timothy and Shank project. And then finally, these are some of our collaborators. Uh, and these are, this is some of our additional funding. So thank you very much.